In the vastness of the Egyptian desert, monuments that have challenged time and human understanding for millennia rise, the pyramids. These colossi were built with extraordinary precision and mastery, representing not only the greatness of an ancient civilization but also one of the greatest enigmas in the history of humanity. Much has been said and written about what the pyramids were. Obviously, there is an official version that explains these magnificent structures in great detail, but there are anomalies that challenge this version, leading many independent researchers to believe that the official version does not work, or at least, many of the provided explanations must be entirely revised. But what are these anomalies? Some are truly surprising, but to properly understand what we are talking about, we must start from the beginning of this story. The Pharaonich history of Egypt begins around 3000 BC and concludes in 30 BC, thus covering a period of about 3000 years. During all this time, 31 dynasties succeeded one another, but the construction of the pyramids concerns only a small part of this history. In particular, the most important structures were built between the 3rd and 6th dynasty. The architectural evolution of these structures did not follow a linear path but saw incredible development in the 4th dynasty, only to regress in subsequent dynasties. This dynasty, which lasted only 90 years, saw the construction of the pyramids of Cheops, Chephren, and Mykerinos. But volume should not mislead us, because it is not just a matter of quantity, but also of construction quality. Indeed, if we look closely, we notice that the 4th dynasty not only built more than the others but also produced works of superior quality. Observing the pyramids built during various dynasties, it is evident that those before and after the 4th did not have the same construction capabilities. The qualitative superiority of the 4th dynasty is undeniable. The pyramids built in that time span are still standing, while those of the others now appear in ruins. But how can this anomaly be explained? This marked difference can be explained by catastrophic events such as wars, plagues, or earthquakes. But the problem is that we have no historical evidence of such events, and moreover, there does not seem to be a great technological difference between the dynasties. However, if we exclude the fourth dynasty from our analysis, we notice a certain continuity in the construction capabilities of these ancient architects. At this point, it would be more appropriate to ask, what happened during the fourth dynasty? And what caused the loss of such construction mastery in subsequent dynasties? If the reason for the incredible construction capability developed during the 4th dynasty remains a mystery. Another highly debated topic concerns the purpose of the pyramids. Why were they built? According to the official theory, the pyramids were funerary monuments desired by the pharaohs. But are we really sure about that? The first question we can ask to answer this question is, how many bodies have been found inside the pyramids? The answer is very simple, none. But not only have the bodies not been found, but neither have the treasures with which the pharaohs were usually buried. Speaking of pharaohs' tombs, we cannot help but think of Tutankhamun and all the legends that have developed around this incredible discovery. In the tomb of the pharaoh, numerous objects were found, including his chariot, canopies, and the sarcophagus itself. The curious fact, however, is that this is not located in a pyramid, but dug into the ground, in the region called the Valley of the Kings, hundreds of kilometers away from the main pyramids. Someone might object by stating that the Great Pyramid dates back to the 4th dynasty, while Tutankhamun to the 18th, therefore, with the passing of the era, the funerary rite might have been modified. But this, as we will see, is not correct. In 1925, near Giza, the tomb of Hetefir's I, the mother of Cheops, the pharaoh to whom Egyptologists attribute the construction of the Great Pyramid, was discovered. The objects found in this tomb are similar to those found in the Valley of the Kings, suggesting that funerary traditions might not have changed so much over time. Egyptologists explain, however, that nothing was found inside the pyramids because over the years they have been subject to numerous acts of looting, which stripped them of all the treasures they contained. To verify whether the Egyptologists' hypotheses are consistent, let's go back in time and rely on the words of Herodotus, the Greek historian considered the father of history, who lived in 484 BC. Herodotus in his texts provides a first important piece of information. At the time he arrived in Egypt, the Great Pyramid was still covered on the outside with white limestone, and the white stone made it shine in the desert, making it visible from very long distances. But Herodotus provides another important piece of information. According to what he learned, the tomb of Cheops would not be the Great Pyramid, but would be located on an island between the waters of the Nile. This king had a canal dug from the Nile to the pyramid. The canal is long, wide, and deep, and was dug to bring water around the place where the pyramid is located, which in this way is surrounded by water having the Nile that surrounds it. 
while the pyramid itself was built in white, smooth, and well-worked stone. Around it was built a terrace of black stone, smooth similar to the stone of many statues. Near the pyramid, on the north side, there is an underground tomb, dug into the ground. It is said that the body of Cheops is in it, and that it is surrounded by water brought there by a canal from the Nile. Since a stone can be rotated like a door, one can enter and exit from this tomb. In 25 BC, however, we have the testimony of Strabo. The Greek historian is the first to provide us with a description of the interior of the Great Pyramid. The pyramid itself, according to Eratosthenes, has a base of seven stades and a height of over six. Its entrance is by a thin stone, which can be lifted by a lever made of a stick. The entrance leads to an underground passage, inclined for a length of 40 cubits, leading to an underground chamber. Strabo describes a descending channel leading into an underground chamber, but this chamber is empty, containing no treasure or testimony of the pharaoh inside. Another interesting testimony is that of the Caliph al marman who in 820 AD enters the Great Pyramid. Not finding the entrance used by Strabo, he decides to create an opening by digging an entrance tunnel, which by a lucky coincidence, crosses the descending channel previously explored by Strabo. al marman also declares to have found the underground chamber empty, but he does not give up and continues his exploration. He dug another passage in the rock that led him to a new environment, what we know today as the Great Gallery. The Great Gallery is an ascending channel, the Caliph went through a new passage into two chambers, later named the Queen's Chamber and the King's Chamber. But this time again both chambers were empty. Disappointed by this discovery, al marman decides to definitively abandon the search. According to Egyptologists, the Caliph found the rooms empty because they had been previously looted. But at this point, it is legitimate to ask, if al marman had to open a gap between the rocks to access the upper chambers, how did the tomb robbers access the upper chambers? According to the official version, the looters had stolen the treasure through a channel, called the Well Channel. This channel, in fact, connects the Great Gallery with the descending conduit discovered by Strabo. It is important to emphasize, however, that this tunnel has a width of only 90 centimeters, has structures that reach 65 and extends vertically for 60 meters. It must not have been easy at all for the thieves to lower themselves and the precious objects through this small well. Objects that, as we have previously seen, could also reach considerable sizes. But let's assume for the sake of argument that the pyramids were indeed tombs and that the objects and the body of the pharaoh are missing because of the actions of the tomb robbers, there is another question that needs to be answered. Why does official Egyptology attribute to the pharaoh Snefru the construction of three pyramids? Egyptologists suggest that Snefru was probably not satisfied with the first two, or that they perhaps had structural problems. And for this reason, he decided to build a third one. It is difficult to counter this explanation. We can only note that it is surprising that the pharaoh engaged in three such projects, two of which were failures, and that he did this in only 50 years of reign. Another debated issue is why there are three sepulchral chambers inside the Great Pyramid, considering that the pyramid was supposed to house only one corpse, that of the pharaoh. The hypothesis put forward to explain the presence of the three chambers is that of a change of project during the work. The first two rooms, the underground room and the queen's room, would have been abandoned due to variations in the project and for this reason would not have been completed. However, this hypothesis takes a hard hit in 1992, when engineer Rudolf Gantenbrink, thanks to a small robot of his invention, made an exceptional discovery. Evidence that undermines the hypothesis of a change of project is the length of the ventilation ducts starting from the Queen's chamber. These, according to Egyptologists, were left incomplete and for this reason extended only for a few meters in height. Gantenbrink's robot, however, totally refuted this belief. Once inserted into the ducts, it showed instead that these were not incomplete, but extended for over 60 meters, even surpassing the king's chamber. To understand why this discovery dismantles the theory of a change of project, we must know that the construction of the pyramid went from bottom to top and that the chambers and all the ducts were not carved into the stone, but were the result of the interlocking of rocks prepared beforehand. Therefore, if there had been a change of project, it would have made no sense to continue building the ducts, it would have been just a huge waste of time and resources. Another controversial and fascinating point concerns the methods and timing of the construction of the Great Pyramid. Over time, various hypotheses have been proposed. One of these envisages the construction of a linear ramp that grows with the growth of the structure. But if this hypothesis seems the simplest, once applied to reality it shows enormous problems. The Pyramid of Cheops is now 138 meters high, at the time of construction its height was about 146 meters. 
Now imagine how long this ramp had to be, to have a not too steep inclination and to allow men to pull the large blocks of limestone and granite. In addition to this, the ramp had to be dismantled and rebuilt every time the structure became higher. We can state that the construction of the ramp would have been more laborious than the construction of the pyramid itself. Other theories hypothesize the construction of spiral ramps, external or internal. If these hypotheses partly solve the problem of the difficulty of constructing a linear ramp, there remains a point still not very clear, the construction times. Several independent researchers have dealt very accurately with this aspect. Let's start with a fact that we know well. We know that the Great Pyramid is made up of 2,415,000 stones. Egyptologists agree that its construction required about 20 years. Now let's pretend that this whole mass of stones is already present at the base of the pyramid. We do not take into account the time necessary for extraction from the quarry and transport. To lay 2,415,000 stones in 20 years it is necessary to place a stone every 4 minutes and 21 seconds. This if we consider a 24-hour working day. If instead we consider the hours of light and assume that the construction site worked 12 hours a day, it would have been necessary to place a stone every 2 minutes or so. Now let's assume that the pyramid was built using ramps. No matter if linear, spiral or external. We know that a man can walk at an average speed of 4 km per hour, but we must consider the inclination of the ramp and the weight of the large blocks that the men had to carry. All this obviously lowers the average speed, but let's make a calculation for excess and assume that under these conditions the average speed is 2.5 km per hour. Now consider a ramp of 200 meters, with a slope of 6 degrees. Under the conditions just expressed, a man would take about 5 minutes and 30 seconds to walk the ramp and reach a height of about 22 meters. With this simple calculation we go well beyond the 2 minutes predicted according to the previous calculation. We are considering a linear ramp that reaches 20 meters, but we know that the pyramid is actually much higher. In addition to this we are not considering that most likely it was necessary to move in narrow passages, that it was necessary to curve to turn around the pyramid and we are not considering the environmental conditions, the heat and the fatigue. Obviously, to all this one can counter by saying that men certainly did not drag a block at a time and this is certainly true, but how many blocks could they actually move simultaneously, considering the space limitations of the ramps and the risk of collapses? Let's now look at a concrete example. In the 60s, during the construction of the Aswan Dam, two temples at Abu Simbel were moved to avoid being submerged. This gigantic project required the division of the temples into stone blocks of 20-30 tons each. It took three years to complete the work and in the end 1,035 blocks were moved. This means that each stone required about 25 hours of work. Let's use this data as a reference and consider only the largest blocks of the Great Pyramid, those weighing between 25 and 70 tons, which we know to be only 2% of the stones that make up the Great Pyramid. Now let's calculate all this for 12 working hours. Well, it would take 133 years to lay them all. To this one can counter by stating that the temples were dismantled with absolute precision and that this required a more precise job, compared to that carried out in the Great Pyramid. But if we think this, we must not forget that we are comparing a technology of the 60s of the 20th century with one of 4,000 years ago. And that we are still talking only about 2% of the blocks, which would have been needed to build the Great Pyramid. It can also be objected that the pyramids had a higher priority than the temples near the dam and that therefore for the construction of the Great Pyramid it was possible to mobilize much more workforce. This is also true, but are we sure that the hypothesis of this incredible number of men used for the construction of the pyramid is so obvious and that this instead did not risk immobilizing an entire country and harming the coffers of the pharaohs? We have almost reached the end of the video. We have examined some of the most important objections that independent researchers raise against the official version that aims to explain what the pyramids are and how they were built. If for many of these questions there is no answer, we do have one certainty. The more in-depth studies are carried out on these incredible structures, the more unclear elements come out. In 2007, for example, the Scan Pyramids project, using muography, an advanced scanning technique, identified a vast cavity inside the Pyramid of Cheops. This large void would extend for at least 30 meters above the king's chamber. Speculations about its origin are multiple. Some hypothesize that it could be the true funerary chamber of Cheops. Others believe instead that it is simply the result of the construction techniques of the ancient architects. The Great Pyramid, thousands of years after its construction, continues to be an enigma that fascinates millions of people around the world. 
Let us know in the comments what you think and if you like the video don't forget to subscribe to the channel.